Again, this is chapter one, nursing assistant in long-term care for the CNA. Again, long-term care is skilled, 24-hour care. You're always gonna have a skilled nurse or therapist there. We no longer wanna call them nursing homes. We'll call them long-term care, skilled nursing or rehab, extended care facilities. Um, they're late to stay, it really just depends. And like she was just saying, you know, there's, the insurance will tell you they're late to stay. Sometimes, if they can, if they can get more days for those people, they try. Um, if the insurance is not going to cover, we're going to have to drop them down to another level, and hopefully, there's a facility that can receive them. Um, but the length of stay, all it is, is how long they're going to stay in the facility. Um, also, know the difference. You're going to need to know the difference between terminal illness and a chronic illness. Terminal means you're going to have six months or less to live, but it, it means that the illness will eventually cause death. So underline that. It will eventually cause death. That's what terminal. Terminal, terminate, just put them together. That's how we're going to go there. Chronic means, and right, it's right up under there, underline that, lasts a long period of time. Just know that difference. They're going to ask you the difference there. Know, and you'll see how we uh, go through the book. We're going to talk a lot about the um, bold. And the bolds are also going to be back here in your definitions. If you will go back and just read your definitions, when, especially when we get about halfway through the book, you should know half of these definitions. Just like that. And you're, you're, it's just like a dictionary of things you should know. And, and they just give you all the definitions of things you should know. If you just go through that dictionary, you will always get, get what you need to know. Oh, they, they'll let you know. But those are your definitions. Um, a diagnosis is made by a doctor. And that's exactly, we do not diagnose even as nurses. CNAs do not diagnose. They don't even want us to give any kind of advice. Even though you might know the, your cure, a home cure, don't. You, that's not something you tell them. You let the doctor do their, their work. Um, also, we want to call them residents, not patients. Um, depends on where you're at. They might call them consumers. Um, or residents. That is where they stay, and that's how we want to treat them. We're going to into their house. It's not like they get a check every month, but their check goes to them to pay the rent, to pay for their medical medical uh, bills. It's not like they're not paying for it. They get their check. So that's how we want to assume that they are paying their rent, just like an assisted living. They're paying their rent. None, none of that's for you. It's, you know, it's coming from the check somewhere. So, um, and it's the same thing. So they're getting their check. And just know that. And um, so we call them residents. And I want you to treat them like you're going into their house. You know, don't be moving my stuff. I can see me. You know, don't do that. <laughs> I want my TV. I want my snacks where they are. Leave them alone. <laughs> um, home health is just what it is. It means care in the home. And sometimes, some of y'all will be able to do that. A lot of your CNA traveling um, will get you there, and, and you have to service uh, home health, and you'll go to different homes and stuff if they need you like that. Assisted living, um, they don't need 24-hour care. And undermine this part up under assisted living. It's independent living in a home-like environment. They just sums it up. Independent living in a home-like environment. Looks more like their home. Um, they tend to be a little more junky. Whereas the nursing home, not so junky, your assisted living, they tend to keep a little more mess. But it's kind of the same care. Uh, assisted living should be able to do on their own. They should be able to um, you know, go to the bathroom on their own. Or that might be the only help they need is to go to the bathroom. Maybe um, it really depends on where you're at. Sometimes they just need their meals cooked for them. Don't, don't trust them around a the stove. It, um, sometimes they just need reminded of their medication. It really depends on what's going on. Dementia care is kind of very similar in the assisted living. They can use the bathroom, they can do all that, but sometimes they just use the bathroom in the wrong places. Um, they just need reminded. And I always think of that as um, the lady who put her dog in the microwave just to dry him. She, you know, she had the right idea to dry him off. She, she bathed him just fine. But when it came to dry the dog off, she wanted to put him in the microwave so it'd dry him on off real quick. <laughs> yeah. And that's why, you know, some of y'all would be at home with people like that. They just do some odd things here and there. They're fine and they, you'd be like, what are you doing? 
and it's they have forgotten they might even think you know this is a toothbrush and they're trying to figure out how how does that work you know for a toothbrush and and sometimes they're aware that they can't remember and it frustrates the mess out of them um and those are the ones that's the most sad to me that they are so sad that they can't remember stuff yes and, and they realize it I want to be the one that, you know, I don't forgot everything, everybody. I'm running around naked and don't care. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and uh, but that is uh, the difference in your care. Adult day services, sometimes um, people who are taking care of people actually stay home and take care of their parents. Sometimes they need a break, just like taking them to the babysitter. You know, keep these for... Um, you know, in a, a certain amount of time. Or maybe you go to work and you still want to keep your parents, but you can't keep them while you're at work, so you take them to the adult day services. Then you pick them up when you get off work. Kind of like they're going to school or they're going to, you know, babysitter. Kind of the same principle. Adult care, uh, acute, sorry, is 24-hour skilled care given in a hospital or at ambulatory surgical centers. I don't mind that. Acute is 24-hour skilled care given in a hospital ambulatory. Those are mostly that short-term immediate care. We need to fix whatever it is, and hopefully we can fix you and you can go somewhere else and, and um, get better. But that's what your hospital is used for, just to go get fixed and then come on out. Um, and it's acute meaning bad. It's uh, something happened to you that is acute meaning it's, it's bad. You can have diabetes, that's a chronic disease, but maybe your sugar went all the way up to 600 and above. That's acute. That means it, it went bad. Um, you break your arm. That's acute. We can't fix nothing. Um, they try to treat that like it's not acute. Wrap it up till you go see the doctor on Monday. You better do something with my arm. <laughs> but um, those kind of things. That's acute care. Right now, service. And then um, come on out. So acute. It's care given in a hospital or long-term care. Used for people who need less than care for the acute, but they're not ready to go home at all. That is your swing bed. Subacute is swing bed. They want you're, you're kind of stabilized, but you're not just ready to go home. Outpatient is less than 24 hours. That's, they, they shoot you out of there. You go have knee surgery, then have two. You have knee surgery, they wake you up and be like, go home. I just had surgery. Can I? <laughs> nope. And walk on your leg. One of my clients, mm -hmm. one of them, they gave me crutches to walk out with. Um, I was, I tried. And um, the other one, they actually told me I could walk on it, as if I could, because they're supposed to have repaired it. Um, but the first time, um, but that's your outpatient care, meaning that they're going to, they, you may have been right there where the doctors are, they have to be there, and then they send you home. And um, that was me. So I've had two knee surgeries outpatient. Sometimes, and I don't know why, sometimes they'll put you in the hospital and keep you a couple of days. I don't know why. Because I'm telling you, they sent me home. Mm -hmm. like, see ya. <laughs> and then um, I was scared because I didn't feel nothing. And then I said, I think I feel my bones in there. I couldn't feel nothing. <laughs> but in my head, I thought I felt my bones scrubbing together. <laughs> I thought I did. But uh, I took my pain medicine for about two or three days and then didn't need them. But it still hurt all that but outpatient care they, they hopefully you'll go home and be able to recuperate rehabilitation is care given by specialists such as speech therapists occupational physical um my example is after the first knee surgery they wouldn't let me touch my toe to the ground for six weeks after that i was stuck just like uh, you know patients get stuck after a stroke they get stuck i was stuck in a bent position, my knee would not bend out. So I know the feeling of getting uh, that feeling of um, doing that split that I can't do. Because that's how my leg felt when they, they would lay me on a bed. My knee would be, you know, my leg was sticking straight up on purpose. That's, I mean, not on purpose, but it was stuck. And they would hang weights on my ankle. And they'd tell me, see how long you can take that? And, and call me when you can't take it no more. And they just lay me laying in the physical therapy and I'm flipping the leg, you know. And I would, I would be good. And then when they did, when I couldn't take it no more, you know, cause I'm strong. I couldn't take it no more. I tell my, oh, 
you got to stay at all. Because it would, it would feel like it's just steady and it would stretch you. Steady, stretch, stretch, stretch. Trying to get me to stretch out. Relax, and then they'll be like, okay, we'll be there in a minute. I'm about to kill them people. <laughs> they about to be dead. And I holler, for, not holler, but two, three, four, five minutes, they would, they would, they would try to make me just do it till I couldn't no more. But um, that is uh, what they do in rehab. Um, they call that physical therapy. They're trying to get you to use what you have and get what you have um, better. And that's same with uh, some people have arm surgeries or all those surgeries and they can't lift their arm. They try their best to get your arm lifted. They do do things to get your arm lifted. So at least you can comb your hair. At least you can do things. That is that um, physical therapy. Occupational therapy is more adaptive equipment. Like, okay, we can't get you straight, but we can help you. We can, uh, my, my friend, her son, arm had got messed up and he didn't have an arm. An occupational therapist is the one who's gonna make an arm. Um, for those people who have uh, had the strokes and their hand can't come back together, they're the ones who make the special spoons and forks that makes them a little thicker so those people can't eat because you know, they get stuck, kind of like that. But they, they make it special. They, I've, I've seen them tied around, have the Velcro so they can eat. And those are people who really want to take care of themselves. They just are not there where um, they can do it on their own like that. That is your rehabilitation. Speech therapist, of course. I went to speech therapy growing up. I got a, I actually was born this right side was, uh, they said it was like a stroke. I forget the words, but um, paralyzed. I still can't see out of this eye. Bell's palsy. A touch of it. Because I've, I've came back, you know, but this eye still don't work, and it's kind of, um, it, you could tell it really when I was young with my tongue. And when I get tired, you get, my tongue starts to act like it want to flip. But people be like, what are you flipping? I mean, it, it, it's like they always ask me if I'm from Louisiana <laughs> when I get real bad. What? <laughs> I make up my own little uh, accent, but um, that's your speech therapist. They're gonna get you to try your best. I couldn't. Um, what was my words? White. Oh, I was, everything was white. Turn white. Look, you know, it's that's right. I didn't say right. It's white. That's white. Turn white. Everything was white. Um, that took a while. And I still will miss that one every once in a while. But um, that it was another word. I mean letters, but. Went through that all, I mean, up until I was, I don't know, sixth grade, I was like, okay, when do you go? I don't want to go to speech therapy no more. <laughs> but they, they tried to get me to talk right. Because um, I would say talk white. That's what, if I didn't go through therapy. <laughs> Hospice, under nine, six months or less to live. That is the definition of hospice. They are expecting you to pass within six months or less. So know that one as well. In our long-term care facilities, we got and do what we call ADLs. That is our job as a CNA. And it's the same thing that you wake up and do every day. You're just going to have to transfer that to somebody else. You wash your hair. You brush your teeth. You um, clean your body. You uh, take a bath. You put on new clothes, honey. You do all that and the above. You go out there. What's the difference between hospital care and they kind of run together. Should be the same. Uh, hospice is when we give comfort care. And um, it so really. Do they do the, the same medication? Yeah, all that. Yeah. It's just comfort. Yeah. They will call it comfort care. If it's hospice, they will. Um, and that's that's the care we call it. Or palliative care, kind of the same kind of care. We don't. We want to make them comfortable and we're out of pain. Well, like, at the nursing home, we've always said they're on hospice care or whatever. And like she was there, it's like comfort. So they change it? I don't know if they've changed it. Yet. Or different people probably just call it different things as well. I'm sure they just call it different things, but they are the same thing. Um, and they might, hospice might be like for them, their definition. You got six months or less to still live. Yeah. And then when they start treating them hospice, they call it comfort care. And it, it's, it's a wordage. I know if it's, they call it yeah, because you can be on hospice and they still do things. 
But most of the time when they label you hospice, and I don't want to be ever labeled hospice, they stop doing things for you. Like even this man, oh, I'm so mad about it. Oh, my friend, my friend's dad. It was a, her real daddy, but still. Um, they put him on hospice. He didn't even know it because he needed a liver and he couldn't find a liver. They was going to give him a liver. Something happened. He couldn't match it or whatever. Something happened and he couldn't receive that liver. And they realized that and he was going to die. And you wouldn't know a man joking, acting a fool, just, just as lively. He just got a bad liver. And, and he did die. I was like, he ain't going nowhere. That man going to live forever because you wouldn't have known it. But he was building up fluids. That's how he really went out. He just started building up fluids and it wouldn't go away. And um, they put him on hospice. So that meant that not only that, that they weren't going to give him dialysis. They weren't going to. They could have done so, a whole lot more things before he died, died. But they just, and they even stopped giving him his blood pressure pills. I was like, oh no, you're going to give me some blood pressure pills because you're trying to help me die. Because I'm obviously I'm going to die if I don't. I don't like that. They don't stop. do that. They stop. Yeah. Don't give me hospice. I will. I will. I will shoot a daughter. Don't. Don't you call me hospice. <laughs> she was 98. Still. <laughs> That's like y'all give her morphine. That's crazy. I actually, one of my friends' grandmother. She had a UTI, responsible by the nursing home because they did not realize she had a UTI. She went crazy, so she was confused. I said, that was her first sign that she was confused that she had a UTI. They put her in the hospital, and by then she stepped it all over. They tried to automatically put her on hospice. This woman walks and normally does everything for herself. I think she's just, not walk, but um, she moves around. She had um, something, but she can, you know, move and do for herself. And uh, I said, no, you go in there and tell them, oh, hell no. There's nothing wrong with her. The reason she's like she is because she's septic. Give her some antibiotics, and she'll be fine. Maybe not because they had waited so long because now she's septic. That means it's everywhere. It goes everywhere. When you're septic, your system knows just, just that, just as well. When um, she lost her mind. <laughs> same thing. Same, very same thing. And I was like, oh, no, you go in there and tell them you want some antibiotics right now. And that you want to, you know, don't just automatically. And what she, she was you. old. She was old. And, and uh, yeah, she can't, she couldn't walk for herself, but she did for herself. She fed herself. She went to the bathroom. I mean, you know, strong lady. Because she didn't, when he got a UTI, automatically hospice. But guess what? He did what I said. And he went on in there and he, he fought. And they started filling up with antibiotics. <clears throat> and she's out of it now, out of the hospital, back in, she was in the nursing home, back in the nursing home doing for herself, seeing her grandbabies and, and, and the same. You know, I just, oh, don't put me on hospice. Don't you, don't you put me on hospice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm fighting to the end, till my clock ticks out. Right. I'm not going to help it tick out. I always say God gives the people um, the doctors reasons to help us keep stay alive. For, for a reason. He didn't just tell them that that. There's a reason for that. You know, so I'm, I'm taking my medications like like um, I should. Don't, yeah, I might be dying and I might die soon, but don't, you're not going to help me die. I'm not signing a piece of paper. And DNR, matter of fact, unless I'm brain dead, take me out. Just unplug me and, and do me out. Otherwise, help me out. You didn't sign the deal? No, I've never signed a DNR. For real? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. Don't ever sign a DNR. No, they can so they let me die. Really I ain't there. ready to die. <laughs> but I can see somebody that signs a DNR and, then, you know, they say you see the heavenly gates or the lights and then you're going to bring me back. I'd be mad at you. Hey, I was dying. I was going to heaven now. And you done brought me back? <laughs> Up to hell. <laughs> I was doing it. <laughs> now I gotta be doing some more. <laughs> I didn't know I was gonna make it. <laughs> I could see me. You know, brought me back and done it. I was I was there. But um yes, don't um DNRs are no joke to play with. If they're in DNR, you do not resuscitate. You let them go. And you 
you really look at your older people's charts. A lot of times when they get in a nursing home, they, they, they want them to be in on. So, you know, if you die, you die. And, and that's the, it's when. Now, if I go dying in my sleep, that's where I want to go. If I'm going to, if, if anything else, I'm going to fight it out. I don't care. I can see my, I don't care if I'm 120. I'm still going to fight it. You know, but, you know, ready to go. I'm, I'm gone, but don't help me. Don't help me die. I'll be, I'll be ready to go one day. But I ain't ready to go. And, uh, but, but, and that's how family members feel when their family members get old, live, live a good, lovely life. You know, like, okay, she's lived a good life. But when they're in pain and when they are, um, you know, just going downhill, that's when I see morphine and I see all that stuff that's helping mm -hmm. them go out lovely without pain. And they may even just close their eyes when they not wake back up, which is fine because they were going. We just, we don't want them to be in pain while they're going. Um, that's when that's good. Not when you see me walk and I'm sitting here looking at you and, and I, I just, I've been through that too, dear mother. And they sat there right in front of us and told us everything. And she's just sitting there and, and she was happy though. She was like, oh, I get my Pepsi and I get my, anytime y'all hear her, you know, she was ready. Your mom was ready. She was ready. And, um. She sat there and listened to the nurse, the hospice nurse, because she was there. It wasn't, you know, I've, I've seen it all. I've seen, you know, she was there. She asked me later on, she said, she asked me, was it, was it they felt good to do that? Yeah. yeah. She, it, but, she, but she was, like, she accepted it when she was like, okay. Then she didn't want dialysis anymore. She had told me. Because they were trying. actually doing, still doing dialysis for her, which is kind of unusual. But she was you know, trying to get me to marry Maceo. <laughs> <laughs> and she, and her last time she said, she said it ain't gonna be too late. Oh, and she. I didn't understand it. because see, she, we didn't know that she had cancer at that time. Yeah, because I think she kept it to herself. I believe she had it in two thousand six, two thousand five. At the it hospital. just never got. Because she was, when she was in the hospital, they wanted to cut her legs off. She oh, yeah, have, that she said that too, right? Oh, no, you're not cutting this, my legs off. She <laughs> <would have that. laughs> and then she, we was, I was sitting in a room with her, and she said, one day, y'all don't wish something she said. One day, y'all don't miss me because I'm gone. I was like, where is she going? And I was gone. You know how mama was. <laughs> yeah, she spoiled. she wasn't letting them cut her legs off. My mama was spoiled, baby. My grandma was Very too. spoiled. Because they want they did want to and had you know scheduled and all that. I wish she did. Like I'm good. I'll go out with my legs on my body. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't let them cut nothing. Nothing. For years they tried to cut, cut, cut. No. Yeah. And she walked up and just stayed. Like, stayed. She was, she was really good. And I, that's the, I always remember that speech. It was her sitting right there. And me and, and Sheila, you. And then your next speech, and I was like, do you think you're going to uh, uh, just describe it to morphine? And when she gets upset and when she starts, you know, being in pain, um, give her some of this. <laughs> Craziness. And I just couldn't take it. I wouldn't be able to take it. I did, and that was, you know, I consider her just like my mom. That's yeah. why they was like, and, and your sister, you know, kept saying, your sister. I was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the hospice care for you. And, um, and she had a good hospice nurse. Yes, yeah, she did. She did. It's, it's, there's, it didn't have to be good. I just couldn't be a hospice nurse. I'd be crying or something. So. I'd be feeling you too much, you know, because people crying, and I know their feelings. I, I be crying too. I just feel people like that, especially somebody passing my loved one, my mother, my daddy, my my loved one. I can't take it. I, I be crying with you. Um, knowing that we're doing activities of daily living though in the and when we're in a nursing home. So same thing you do for yourself, we're going to do for others. 
Um, and also wound care may come in. Some uh, have some types of wounds. A lot of people don't not realize, and I have to stress this, and people don't get it. You do not tote things to grandmother when she's down or out because she gets weaker and weaker the more you bring her stuff. And I'm saying, you know, and, and you think you're being lovely and wonderful to grandma or, or mother or whoever it might be. You're bringing her food. She ain't got to move. I'm bringing her breakfast, lunch, and dinner in bed. Turn her TV for her. Next thing you know, you're bringing the, um, the toilet. And, and you got an automatic toilet seat right beside her. You know, and she just she ain't even got to go to the bathroom no more. You are encouraging weakness. Next thing you know, she's not going to walk no more. Next thing you know, if you're not trained, next thing you know, uh, wound sores, irritation, rashes, because now she's not getting up. She's urinating on herself. You know, and, and it helps. Not that that you could have avoided it, but you tried to avoid it. You tell grandma, and you help grandma to the kitchen table to eat. And then she's keeping some of her muscles, keeping some of it. It may not work. It may do. But you, I've seen a lot of people just just make it where now they can't walk thinking it's, they're doing a good thing. You don't do for everybody, and they teach you that. Let them do for themselves. Self-care makes you not only feel better about yourself, but keeps your muscles going, keeps your from getting atony, which is just weak muscles. Um, they have to do for themselves. And you never just let somebody just not do. That's not conducive to them getting better. Just like if you ever had the flu, lay there in the bed for two weeks, how hard it was just to get about that bed and feel so lazy and your muscles are weak. And but you, you got to come out out of it. Imagine an older person who's had all. Oh, it could have been some hip surgery. She's weak. She's tired. She's you know, she, but she's got to get up and work it to get on out of that bed. You wouldn't believe the amount of people who've had surgery, hip surgery. That was walking. That's how they got hip surgery. They either their muscles were or their bones were weak and it broke, or either they fell and they broke. Either way. But these people were walking. And now they laid in the bed, got weak, and now they can't walk. Now they're in a wheelchair somewhere. So many. When these people were walking before their surgery, I'm like, oh no, you you were walking. You can get back up. Come on. Come on work this I know your muscles are weak and but if you let them stay weak that's where they're gonna stay and then they're gonna just progress where they can't do for themselves uh, everything's got to be brought to them or whatever don't do everything for for people don't do it um <coughs> wound care may come you might have different tubes some of them have catheters nutritional therapists they're the ones helping them you know if they're diabetic give them a diabetic meal uh, management of chronic diseases, Alzheimer's, AIDS, di diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Know that word, COPD. A lot of people um, don't know what that is, but that's all it stands for, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. They're the ones that um, are going to be breathing hard. They walk down the hall a little bit, and they have to sit down for a second, literally, because they're not getting the oxygen that normal people do. And um, then you're going to have to really let them sit, think a minute, and, and walk again. But that is your COPD. Congestive heart failure is much the same. Um, they're not getting that the oxygen where it needs to go. And, and they get tired as well. And, and um, that's when people swell a lot. And that'll tell the tail on that congestive heart failure. Uh, culture change in the blue. Read all these blue boxes. We may just go right by them. But all the, the, it's just important stuff resident, of residence rights. They're trying to do a culture change, which is meaning... Um, in, in, in the nursing homes now, instead of treating everybody as a whole, they want to treat you individually. That's all they're trying to say is person-directed care, meaning um, you like this, we're going to try to get you this. You like this, and we're going to try to do you this way. You always care for everybody the same. You always dignify those people. You always um, do the same for everybody, but yet we're going to treat them like they're an individual and not like they are just everybody's the same, if that makes any sense. Always dignity, respect, caring, always, always, always. And um, now they want you to do more individual, but you still can't, um, you can't bring you something and you don't bring them something. Just like kindergarten, you can't bring you the birthday cake and don't expect the rest of the people to eat. <laughs> can't bring you one cupcake, you gotta bring three cupcakes. 
Same kind of thing. Even when you're the nursing home, you don't bring, you don't show favoritism. If you do and you want to give to one person who maybe their family don't come, you got to give it to their social worker. To be ethical, give it to their social worker. Tell them this is for this person and let them give it to them. Or else they're going to look at you and treat you a little different and maybe not even listen to the next CNA. It won't do right for the next CNA because you, you're their CNA. You know, and you try to, and that, that helps for all the CNAs. And you'll see, because you start being, you know, some, and, and a lot of people have, you know, their favorite person, you know, um, and that's okay. But you don't want them to not be cooperative to the next CNA that comes because you're their CNA. Oh, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not even taking a bath. That's what's going to get you. I'm not taking a bath. I'm waiting for Tammy to come back. Guess what Tammy's got to do when she come back? One more person, she got a bathe. Because this should have been bathed yesterday. But, mm, Tammy's my, my, my CNA, and I'm not going to bathe with you. And that's, they will do that. <laughs> it's good to have, you know, and they are real cooperative with you, but in the end, it might be that you got some more work going on. Um, Medicare, Medicaid. They are run by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is the CMS. So everybody is up under the CMS. That Medicaid and Medicare is up under the CMS. That is the government facility. Um, Medicaid is more ran up under each state. So each state is their monies for Medicaid. That's why Georgia doesn't pay their CNAs as well, because Georgia doesn't get as much as Florida does. And um, they, they reciprocate, not reciprocate, but put their monies where they want to put their monies. And Florida actually, if you just walk across that line, you'll get paid more as a CNA. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's not, because it's, we're in the same kind of facilities, we're in the same area, you know, but that, that the line means a lot. Um, so I even encourage people that, you know, get you right, get your job straight, get your car right, get you, I don't know what you got going on, but get it right and then try Look at that floor. Cause you might get a three dollar raise just just to drive ten more, twenty more miles. Um, and that's worth it. Florida doesn't have tax. Yeah. Okay. So you just have to pay your Georgia. Yeah. In your tax, in your check from Florida is not gonna have no taxes taken out. You be like, dang. I think they've got might have, uh, what they call local taxes, but not state. Somebody, like yeah, yeah, you get your more of your paycheck in Florida, but you still gotta pay your uh, Georgia tax, which is crazy. But um, I don't think if I earned it in Florida, I shouldn't have to pay tax on it anyway. I earned it in Florida, but they don't feel that way. <laughs> uh, Medicare, know that it was invented in 1965 for people 65 and older under 9M. 65 for 65 and older. And just know that y'all gonna get a workbook too. I hope that they send the workbooks along with the book. But um, that's one of your questions, right? Um, for 65 and older, they want you to know also part A, B, C, D. Part A is to pay for hospital or skilled nursing. That's the one that they, they're charging the doctor bill to. Or, or the hospital stay, I should say. Because part B pays for the doctor. Um, also, Part B pays for equipment. So if you need crutches, they're going to charge Part B. And, and it, it matters when some people have insurance and they pay out their check. They get that $1,200 check, whatever, from Medicaid, Medicare. And out of that comes their insurance, comes their, you know, wherever they're at. If they're living in a home of their own, they're paying this. They're paying for an extra piece of insurance. And, and just know that it's, it's, it's costly. Part C pays for, uh, that's the private health insurance companies do uh, some billing, and that's what they, um, you know, you'll, you'll hear them say they've got Medicaid and Blue Cross Blue Shield. And it's, that's, that's the umbrella over it. And they will take care of some of, of, the, of the charges. But again, it's not free, they're paying for that part. Um, and a lot of them don't get Part D until they really need it. And uh, I think it must be expensive. But that's when their medications get to be a whole lot lower. When their copay be a dollar or two dollars. 
that's because they got Part D. And that's for medications, underlying medications, Part D. And sometimes when people start getting medications and, and just finding out that they're sick and, and they already have Medicare, we will, uh, you know, encourage them, you need Part D. Or else you're going to pay $200 and $100 or... Yes, and, and it, it costs. And, and, and you don't want to be paying stuff like that. Underlying Medicaid. I just under low, low income people. When I was a LP and I was actually making um, money, I had got, uh, I was in, I forget what I was. I was making decent money and um, got pregnant. I actually had miscarriage. But um, I got, I still got uh, Medicaid. So they kind of like automatically, for the children's sake, they're going to put you on pregnant Medicaid. And they, they kind of keep you there. Um, and they'll put your children on there almost automatically for three months or so, and then you have to re-up or whatever and see if you still qualify. But just you getting pregnant will get you on Medicaid real quick because they, they want you to take care of them babies. And, um, you know, that, that's the incentive to, for healthy babies. So just know that if that happens. Yes, all, all of that. I just, ooh. But yeah, they have to pay for a lot of stuff. Um, describe the nurse assistant's role. We do all kind of stuff. We do temperatures, vital signs, and you're gonna have to have, make a 100 on your vital sign test. Just like the nurses gotta make 100 on their drug test. CNAs, 100 on your vital signs. You got to know what vital signs are, are um, within range so you can report them. How are you gonna report that somebody's messed up if you don't know what's supposed to be uh, normal? So we will actually, I'll give you a piece of paper that I haven't gave y'all a bottle size sheet paper yet. Okay, today is the first thing. So we're on track. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's all the way back to the left. There's a light. The light's on. Oh, okay. Really? Let's start. I'm trying to download it right here. I can find it. Look. <laughs> I seen her jump. <laughs> she was coming back. <laughs> oh, that was too funny. But um, as a nurse assistant, we do all kinds of stuff. Um, and they list everything, assist with toilet if he needs, help them move around, uh, help keep their areas neat and clean, meals, supplies. We still got to uh, stock up supplies. Don't be the last one to use the gloves. And say somebody else is going to stock the gloves. Sure enough, you're going to need those gloves in a minute. <laughs> and so if it's empty, go ahead and restock the gloves. Um, assist with meals, making beds, giving back rubs. That'll be nice if you got time. Um, that's always a help the patient go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Give them a good old back rub and they'll leave you alone. Um, and helping residents with mouth care. All of that is part of our duties. The, um, I'm going to ask y'all again. I'll come back to that part. I want y'all to really underline that. But um, charting is what we do now. When you get into the nursing home, you're no longer just writing stuff down. You're not making a note of it. You're not doing anything like that. When you write in their record, it is called charting. And that's how you're going to, that's your word that you'll be using. Let me go chart. It's not let me go write this down in their in the book. It's let me go chart. And that's, that's what they call it. That is um, medical talk. That's, and those are the words you'll use. So I'm going to go chart. And I'm, going, I'm documenting what, what you just said. Or I'm documenting what I just did. Um, that is called charting. And that means it's going into the chart. And that becomes that legal record. That we got to make sure that it stays good. Um, residents' rights. Responsibility for residents. All residents are the responsibility of each nursing assistant. You're going to have your hall one, your hall two. But guess what? You're in hall one east. You're in hall one west. Whatever. You're, you're managing. You're together somewhere. You're in there taking a 30-minute bath. You know, maybe, hopefully it won't take that long. 15, 20 minutes. But another one of your patients is ringing. Ring, ring, ring. Like, golly. She, on the other end, hopefully will answer that light for you. Just go check and shit. Make sure they're not on the floor. Make sure they're not, it's not a life or death situation first. And if it can wait, your CNA will be right out. She's busy right now. 
Um, or if it's something you can tell the nurse, you know, like, okay, I'll tell the nurse or whatever. Um, but if it's something that can wait, your nurse, uh, your CNA will be out the minute and she'll get busy. But um, you got to do that. Teamwork. Because what's going to be next is you're in there doing something that takes taking forever. And one of your patients need help. So if y'all do not work like that, y'all would not have a good day. And your patients are not going to have a day because you're going to be in there doing something with one of your patients while your patients are waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. When, when if y'all work together, then she can at least ask, appease the patient for a minute. Even if you got to come out and do your patient, but at least make sure you take care of that patient. And especially check just to make sure they're not on the floor. That they're not hollering for help. They're not having a heart attack. Oh, uh, you know, oh, she'll answer it when she gets out. 20 minutes, that patient is dead 20 minutes ago. So always check the light. <coughs> Even if there's nothing else that you can do or, or something that can wait, check the light just to make sure. Otherwise, you're good to go. But you will be assigned those people. Those You're going to really be responsible for your patients. Always make sure your patients are straight. Then, then help out those. Um, just, uh, just know that if you see a patient, she's trying to get out that door, you know, she's mentioned, she will walk off on you, and she's not your patient, you just don't say, oh, she's not mine. Be like, oh, I don't see that. You go over your responsibility. If you see it, then it's your responsibility to help it out. Imagine a man who knows he can't walk, because they'll do this too, try to get up and start walking. Hey, will you sit down, please? <laughs> And sometimes I actually had one of my one of my CNA students that actually just had to babysit a man, really, because he just wanted to walk and he couldn't walk, and like he couldn't get it in his head that he couldn't walk, pulling on everything, trying to get up, and he had some strength to, and he done it a lot, <laughs> and that's what one of y'all's and I say y'all but it was CNA clinicals, one of the girls' jobs was just to babysit him, make sure he would stay in his wheelchair or. Or he would stand up and let you stand behind him with his wheelchair. Just not to, um, but he could walk. And it was like, please sit down, Mr. 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 You know, but his tail went. But um, that was a good job. That would be nice job to have. But what I wanted to say for you to come back, I want you to look under figure 1-4. Were well, the ladies drinking the coffee or something? She's drinking it out of a coffee mug. Up under there tells you what a nurse assistant is not allowed to do. Not allowed to insert or remove tubes, change sterile dressings, or give tube feedings, or give medications. Underline all that. Make sure. Do you need a pen? Oh, I'm Oh, I was going to say. Let me give you a pen because I don't see one either. But um, underline all that. That is very important. What you cannot do, don't let somebody ask you to do something that you cannot do. And then we just reiterated that charting is actually you're writing it in, in a chart now. You're documenting. We don't call it writing it in there anymore. We call it charting. You're going to go chart this. You're going to um, make sure it gets in the chart. But all of that is charting now. Um, and that you are responsible for any resident that you see that about to, I don't know what they might be about to do. But <laughs> escape or fall or if you see it, you, you need to help them. She may be still in there doing that 20-minute bath and 10 lights don't went off. But you still need to go and check, just make sure they're okay. And if you see her patient in the hallway about to fall, you need to help. Which is a good thing. Everybody, you know, you'll get your system and you'll get a little system. Yeah. And you'll get a little system that you got going on that you'll know which patients that does what at what time. You know, I know when, right after lunch, I know she's going to go. Or right that she wakes up, I know she's going to go. You start to learn, and you can make your own little schedule. Like, oh, i got to get her, her, and her first thing in the morning. And I got, and you'll just know your, when you start knowing your patients. You'll, you'll have a little system set up, and you will have a good day if you pay attention to your patients. Describe the care team. Of course, we're going to have a nurse and assistant. That's us or y'all. Um, for federal training purposes, you have to have 74, 75 hours. Uh, Georgia says 85 but um, some of them go all the way up to 100. I've seen 120. But um, really, you only need uh, 75 federal, 85 Georgia. A registered nurse, 
It's just always going to be on call. Sometimes she'll be given medication, doing wound care. It really depends. In nursing homes, she'll probably be the wound care nurse, uh, case management nurse, um, and supervisor. The FN normally is the one on the floor. She'll give medications and uh, wound care. Um, but they kind of consider that LPN is, is your supervisor as well. Some people bypass that the LPN and go to the RN. It really depends on where you're working, who you would ask your questions to. Uh, the physician or the doctor is, of course, over everybody, um, and that is part of your team, and they are the ones that tells us what we need to be doing. Physical therapists, underline uh, uh, PT gives therapy in the form of heat, cold, massage, ultrasound, electrical stimulation, and exercise the muscle, bones, and joints. That's what's important to know about your physical therapist. They give therapy in the form of heat, cold, massage, ultrasound, uh, electrical stimulation, exercise the muscle, bones, and joints. Your own body. They're messing with your own body. They're, the next thing we're going to talk about, I think, yes, is occupational, where they're going to help you enhance your body. Physical therapist is working with your body. Okay. Come on down, occupational therapist or up, uh, HC. They're the ones. I want you to underline and star adaptive, assistive, or adaptive devices. They're going to be the ones who get that big spoon. They're the, the something that's going to help you get better. Physical therapy gets you 98%. But to get you even better, we're going to get the occupational therapist in there and try to do some, some tweaks and turns and see if we can um, do some other things for you. But there's a, a system of adaptive devices for occupational therapists. Speech and language pathologists, they're very important. A lot of people think it's just about speech, but in the um, nursing home, especially in the hospitals, they will come and evaluate people's swallowing abilities. They're the ones that's coming because they know all the muscles that's going on right here. That's what they had to learn in speech therapy class. They had to learn all these muscles so we can try to make them work, but um, also swallowing. And so know that the SLP, and underline that, and SLP also evaluates a person's ability to swallow food and drink, along with speech. Like if you've had a stroke, they're going to try to help you talk because a lot of times um, that tongue just will probably be terrible. But the, um, it gets uh, very weak, and they can't form words. So know what the SLP does. It helps evaluate food and drink, the swallowing. Then you got to have a registered dietitian, helps with the meals. Medical social worker, those are the people, kind of reminds you of, like if you're in high school, your counselor. Somebody you can go and talk to and ask some questions to, and hopefully if you don't have what you need, that they can help you get what you need. Activities director, they are, that's what it is, activities, they, they run the activities. Sometimes I've seen a CNA promoted to activities director or an activities person, which is wonderful. Um, you get to do all the activities. I said, I, I love a nursing home and I don't mean it, but um, they celebrate every holiday. They decorate every holiday, they get, you know, king and queen of the ball. You know, they always do that. So um, that's a nice job too. Uh, and also part of the care team, they want to emphasize the resident and the resident's family. Both of them are included, along with your doctor, nurses, care team, resident, and family. So circle, resident and family are part of the healthcare team. Without the resident, you don't have a team anyway. So all of that is together. Also know your chain of command. All that is is um, who's who you going to go and say any problems you got or who you need to report somebody to or um, who you just need to ask a day off to. You need to know your chain of command. So whoever's up next, you don't like what they say, politely say, okay, um, I respect your opinion, but I'm going to ask Miss so-and-so. Don't say I'm going to go talk to your supervisor because that just puts you on a whole nother level. That just that just don't sound good. Just say, and I'm from experience, just say, um, you know, I, I respect your opinion, but I'm going to go talk to Miss so-and-so. We're going to know Miss so-and-so is our supervisor, but when you say I'm going to go tell your supervisor or something like that, that just messes you up. That just puts you on a whole nother level. You might be fired the next day because you're going to find something that you ain't done right. <laughs> so I'm just saying. Uh, be, be cordial, polite, and let her know that you just don't agree with it. And it could be anything. Um, anything. Just, just, and you 
can have your own opinions, and hopefully you work in a place that you can have opinions. But let them know. Don't say I'm going to go to your supervisor. I'm going to, or I'm going to go over your head. None of that. Just say I'm going to go ask Miss So and So. They'll know that that's that's you taking up the correct line or chain of command, and that's what you're supposed to do. It's just a it's a attitude you don't want if you say the wrong things. Especially if it's any kind of heated disagreement. So just just know that because I'm, I'm telling you, I've been on the both receiving end and the, well, I call it both receiving end. I've heard somebody tell me that as well as somebody, I've told somebody else that. So I know the difference. The reactions are a whole lot different the way you handle people. Um, know that liability is a legal term. You are working under a nursing license. You, you have your certificate, you have your license, you have your, um, they don't call it degree, but you are working that. Your nurse is the one actually really truly responsible for everything you do. And sometimes they get a little too overbearing trying to figure out what you're doing, uh, making sure that they have to be your supervisor. You actually do work under them. And um, hopefully you won't get one that's just all up under you trying to make sure you're taking care of your patients right. And most of the time, you just assure that your nurses, I got this, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't need you on top of me. Um, but it's their license you're working under. So if you mess up, it's something that they should have told you or that they didn't tell you. Or, you know, you can always blame the next one. And even the LPN may blame the next one. <laughs> the RA, I'm trying to blame somebody else. But that's how it, it, it but normally it falls. Try to go up. Normally, it goes right on down, um, and they're probably the just just know that some people will um, be a little bit more looking on you than others. I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna watch you until I know you're good. You're good with your patients. You try whatever that you're doing the right thing. Um, then I'm gonna leave you alone. Until then, you know I might eyeball you and make sure you're doing right. Did you go turn that patient? Cause some CNAs, you know, they try to get by, but we're gonna, we're, I'm gonna make sure that you're not one up under me doing that, and we'll be fine. I'll help you do whatever you need. Um, but yeah, you're working under their license. So if you do something wrong, it's not your license. Your license might get got too, but they're gonna, no matter what, go up that step. Somebody, whoever you're working under, is their responsibility. Cause you should have told them better. You should have stopped them if they was doing something wrong. Or you should have ed educated them if they didn't know what they were doing. And that's where they, they tell you. And so both of them get in trouble. Um, so that's your liability. So know that some of them may aggravate you. And that may be why. Um, and that's what that little diagram is showing. Know that you have a scope of practice. Underline that as a definition. Scope of practice, page 7. You can do so much. And that is your scope of practice. And, and underline what it, the definition is. It defines the tasks that healthcare workers are allowed to do and how to do them correctly. Underline that. The tasks that a healthcare provider is allowed to do and how to do them correctly. It's called your scope of practice. So if somebody asks you to put in a catheter, have you noticed anywhere in your readings or your skills, or have, do we learn how to put in a catheter? Mm -hmm. That is beyond your scope of practice. We don't learn that. We're not gonna be doing that. And um, sometimes you might be able to do extra things. Probably not that, that's zero technique. But they may ask you to do some things, but they have to verify that you have been trained. You was not trained in CNA school to give finger sticks. But some jobs require you to, but they've got to have somewhere that you have been trained on all the aspects of finger sticks. And um, it's not hard to do, but there's always the, the why of what you do. You can always do a finger stick. I mean, finger stick. But why are you doing what you're doing? Where do you give it at? Why? What complications might happen? All that little stuff you got to learn too, and that's that certification. They got to let know that you done did something. So that is your scope of practice, um, and that is what we underline it back there. You're not allowed to insert or remove tubes, change sterile dressings, give tube feedings, or give meds. There's an extra little um, certification that I'm going to put out there in a couple of weeks. Um, but you have to have BSCNA already. And it's called a medication aid. You get to be a state certified medication aid. 
and that's where you can go and give out medication in, in um, nursing assistant um, or homes. And you'll be able to do that. But, um, but I'm going to throw that out there in a couple of weeks and see if all my old students are ready to do that yet. Yeah. Because you get to be a CNA, but you have to be a CNA to get that certification. So y'all can come back one day or just call me and ask me. But it's, um, it's kind of a short course. Um, we're going to do it in three days and get you certified. In three oh, days? Three days. Because yeah. normally they just... Um, How long do you have to do a CNA for Just to have your certification. No, no time. No time. And that'll get you off the floor as much. And they do that assisted living a lot. Um, no, that the resident care plan. A nurse creates that care plan and they have one for everybody. And it's telling what, what's, what we're going to do. What, what we're going to do for that patient, no, special about that patient, what we're going to perform for that patient. That is their care plan. Who's going to do it? What time they're going to do it? it? It's a whole little thing, a whole little schedule of what we're going to do for that patient. And that is done um, and updated. So they have done that. That is their care plan. Know what a policy and procedure is. A policy is, of course, action that should be taken every time a certain situation occurs. And the easiest one I can always think of is, like, if, if someone falls, what do you do? You pull out this paperwork. First thing, right there, still taking care of a patient, we call somebody for help. We do not pick up the patient. Our policy is to always notify and not let our patients fall, but the procedure, if they do fall, is this. That's your policies and procedures. They're gonna, our policy is to protect patients from falls. Our procedure, if things happen, is this. Our procedure to prevent falls is keep the walkways clear. Um, don't let them walk anywhere that is wet. Um, if there's uneven flooring, label it. Um, all that, that that's your policy. Keep them, keep them out. Procedure, if something happens, is what paperwork to fill out, what do we do? You never pick up a patient unless um, somebody has evaluated that patient first, your nurse, because you they might have broke something. A lot of, you know, patients will. You never chart that you've seen somebody fall unless you've seen them fall. They might have just got in the floor. You know they fell. But you do not chart that. You came in the room and they was on the floor. They might have went and sat there just to be facetious. We know where Yes, and I know. I, I have two. <coughs> um, I had one that done it and then tried to sue later. So you went and sat on the floor and put some water in the floor and everything. You know, and, and tried to say I put the water on the floor. I was like, when did I put the water in the floor? You know when you came and got, gave me medication. I was like, oh, God. I did come and get medication, but I didn't spill no water in the floor. Oh, yeah, I spilled the water in the floor, and she got up and, and fell in the floor. But what, what told on her is she had um, she had her toothbrush and toothpaste in her hand. So I guess she was she thought of that and said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on this floor and do this. I don't know how she got on the floor. But she had her toothbrush and toothpaste. So um, it was like, well, you walk right past that same water going to the bathroom, but you fell coming back from the bathroom. So they knew she had got up. And, um, and we had been in there all night looking at the patient anyway. Not we didn't trip and fall. But, you know, that's when I told him, I said, I'm not giving nobody any medication unless they come out their room and give it to me. And I, it to <laughs> and I ain't lying. I, our patients could get up and walk. You know, but um, man, that's what I did from then on. I said, oh, no, I'm not going to be involved in that. Because she would say, yes, you, I, I'm not mad at you for leaving the water in the floor. I said, if you say stuff like that to me again, because they told her not to talk about it no more. Um, she was doing a lawsuit. Don't, let's don't talk about it. You're already doing a lawsuit. They're still taking care of you. I would have sent your tail home. But uh, <laughs> you would not be in my facility no more. But, um, yeah, uh, it, she did not win eventually. But that's what made me um, there. They got up. You want some medication? One o'clock at night. You're gonna have to get up and come. And, and their medication that they took around the clock was detox meds. You want your detox meds? You're gonna get it. If you're asleep anyway, I shouldn't be waking you up because that means you're not detoxing so bad. Obviously, because you're asleep. I used to tell them that they get so bad with me. <laughs> We're detoxing. I can't take it. I said, okay. Then you didn't need that because your tail was asleep. So you was doing just fine. <laughs>
if you was having troubles, I, I would have helped you. But um, yeah, always, always just watch out for yourself. Things like that. And I don't know where I was going. Oh, that was policies and procedures. Know your policies and procedures. When something happens, what are we gonna do after? If 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 you got stuck by a needle, what you gonna do? If you find a needle in somebody's bed, you should never. But if something happens, I don't know what could happen. Um, and you get stuck, then um, what do you do? Those are your policies and procedures. Um, also, come on page eight. The underline the most important thing on that page is tasks not listed in the care plan or approved by the nurse should not be performed. If it's not on there, don't do it. It may be that she had a stroke, you had a stroke. Your right-sided weakness, your left-sided is stuck. You over there doing range of motion on her right arm and left arm because she's got range of motion. We're not supposed to mess with that arm that is stuck. A physical therapist comes and tries to help them out and do, do stuff like that. Or we might do range of motion. But it, normally they, it, they're going to write it and spell it out. But we're over here trying to bend this arm that it won't bend. You know, it's got to be in the care plan what we're going to do. So don't do it if it's not in the care plan. Know what professional and personal means. Pro professional, of course, that's your um, treating patients correctly. Coming to work on time. Charting that when you're supposed to. Um, doing your stuff on time. Keeping that positive attitude. No discussing your personal problems. No using them cell phones. You want to, uh, I know how it is. Keep your cell phone in your pocket. Pretend you don't have it. It's your best bet. And I always say you don't have it. If it rings in your pocket, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you, your best bet is to just check it periodically. Um, and I know how people, they, they keep, they keep, um, they keep cell phones on even though they're not supposed to. You know, I want to I wanna be attached to the phone if something happens to me. Back in the days, you can just call, try to call the front desk and see if they can get you. But now, you know, that even the front desk don't like to even get those calls nowadays. So, oh yeah, I'm keeping a phone in my pocket somewhere, wherever. But um, just know your facility policy, if it's there. Um, you don't want to call people sweetie, honey, dearie, because that's disrespectful. <laughs> um, even that's though it happens, <laughs> it happens, baby, or, or something. I'm going to be like, I do it too. I think we get to a certain um, age, probably everybody. Yes, yes. Oh, I, but um, I have a tendency when I get to be, when I'd rather be cussing, I will call you sweetie. Okay, sweetie. <laughs> you know I might be mad. <laughs> I'm trying to not say other words, but I will, and, and it just makes me I feel some kind of way. I will call you sweetie, like, you know, but, uh, yeah, but don't do that, and just because some people love it, um, and you'll hear it, but being more professional is not doing that. You call them by their first and last name, Miss Davis, whoever, but um, you call them by their first and last name. Never give or accept gifts, and they say this about a thousand times. Um, you don't want to do that as well. If you're trying to give somebody something, give it to their social worker and let it come back to them. Um, just because of the amount of favoritism that may happen, and then I would be jealous. You know, oh, you gave her a brand new song. Where's my brand new songs? Don't touch me. <laughs> I want some brand new socks too. You know, so you gotta be very careful on how you do things. Um, and it may be that you hand them to them and just say somebody else bought them. I don't know. But do not um, do the favoritism thing. Um, don't accept gifts. Sometimes they'll, they'll give you, they want to give you some money, give you this. At home care, uh, I've had several people that they accept whatever they give them, which is okay. You only got one patient, but you don't want to confuse that with um, extorting. What's what the word is? You know, elderly. You don't want to take. Extortion. Yeah, you don't want to take that money because you're taking care of them. I'm gonna take care of you because I get paid. You pay me, or you pay my company to take care of you. You do not have to give me extra money. So don't don't get caught up in that by taking monies and then later that patient ain't got no money because they're just so nice and they like you that much. They even gave you all their money. <laughs> it may happen. No, you just tell them I, I cannot. My 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 company will not let me do that. Um, 
the best time, and you can tell me, you know, you can give it to me in my Christmas bonus or something like that, because that is acceptable. At a one-time bonus or something like that, or something like that. Not, or like a birthday. You can save it for my birthday um, gift. Something like that, but not, you know, the ordinary, normal, I'm just taking care of you. I don't need you to pay me. I'm getting paid. You know, you got to be careful with that, because they will call that extortion. But Christmas bonus, birthday, something like that. You know, do that, but you don't want to do that on a on a regular basis, because they already get paid. You know, so be watchful on that, because you've got mothers and brothers and sisters that are looking at this person's money as well. Where's all of her money went? Oh, she is taking that from my mother. She's already getting paid to take care of my mother. You know, so you gotta watch that. Watch it, because they with their family members are terrible. <laughs> That's, that's what is going to get you. Even though the patient is just that sweet, want to give you everything she got. Um, just know that as well. Professional relationship with your employees or employers. Complete your tasks efficiently. Follow all your policies and procedure. Report things that you see you are now must report. If you see somebody hurting somebody, um, any, any, any kind of abuse, you are now to report it. Or if you don't report it, you are part of the abuse. Then you allow it to happen. So if you see something like that, you got to report it. Um, make sure you um, let somebody know ahead of time. If you can't come to work, give them four to five hours because they're gonna have to. They're gonna have to try to find somebody to cover you. Uh, sometimes they don't get anybody to cover, but make sure that um, you, you let them know ahead of time. You gotta be compassionate, have empathy and sympathy. Empathy is more is me. I. It, it, you want to try to stay out of the empathy zone because empathy is actually like you feeling exactly what they're feeling and you, you know I, you're sad I'm saying sympathy is feeling for them okay I'm sorry this happened to you you, you understand you know but empathy is more you kind of feeling the same thing you don't you want to stay out of the empathy part but sympathize with people you got to be honest tactful if you got something you don't like Especially coworker to coworker, be very tactful when you're trying to tell somebody you don't like what they're doing, um, or they you don't like the way they do this. You know, either keep it to yourself or be very tactful when you tell somebody because that can, you don't want people having harboring weird feelings while you're having to work for them, even though it tension. I just don't like tension in the workplace. Be conscientious. You're always gonna have to be looking, working, looking around, observating. Observing things that's happening, um, always keeping your eye open, and you got to be attentive, um, dependable. Be patient, of course. Don't rush your patients. You always want them to do as much as they can on their own. And half of that, a lot of people just go ahead and do it for them because it's faster. And I'm done with my patient. I want to go to the next patient. Let them do what they can, you know, and allow them to do what they can. Of course, being respectful, uh, prejudice. You may go through with um, all kind of many people just always be respectful and um, not prejudiced and tolerant because someone's going to aggravate you to death <laughs> it, it tends to be the one that you, you you smile at when she when she says says something nice she's mean and hateful for two weeks but then she says i just love you when you come in here and you're like i, I didn't know that but that's how you feel to the mean one but um tolerant gotta be tolerant to, to those things and tolerant to your other co-workers who are not going to do everything that you do the way you do it um, that's tolerant you, you, you may not do it their way but as long as the end result is taking care of that patient it's okay we're taking care of the patient uh, list examples of legal and ethical behavior ethics underline what ethics are it's the the knowledge of right and wrong we know um, what is right and wrong in I can say what you think is right and wrong. I may think drinking is fine. What you think is wrong. Those are your ethical feelings. That's how you feel. That's how you you think. Even even down deep inside, you may have some ethical things yourself that you don't even follow. But you don't think it's right. But you don't follow it anyway. And that's kind of me. Growing up in uh, the church I grew up in, <laughs> but I said I'll go back to that one day. But those are your ethical thinking—the thing that goes in your head and says you shouldn't be doing that. You know better than that. 
That's your ethical thinking. Where our laws is exactly what it is. Somebody wrote it down and said, this is a law, this is what you follow. Ethical is a little gray line sometimes. And I always go back to uh, the Jehovah Witness who does not like any, uh, anybody else's blood. But then you got this their six-year-old daughter who needs blood to survive, and they don't want to give nobody's, they don't want nobody's blood. They didn't save no blood. The daughter didn't save their blood ahead of time, but she needs life-saving blood. An ethical committee would, would say, you know, well, what's right, what's wrong in that situation? What's ethical about that? Is it, okay, we need to listen to the parents. That's their child. That's their religion. You know, and you have to weigh all that and, and figure out what's going on. And, and you figure all that out. We'll take a break in a minute. Um, so that's an ethical decision. But they'll probably take a lot of more people and probably, hopefully, I would rule to overrule rule the parents. You know, if they, if you was to ask my 11-year-old granddaughter right now, you know, oh, yeah, I'll take some more blood. You know, that's, that's their religion. <laughs> you know, she would just, you know, like, okay, that's my parents. And, yes, you're supposed to follow my parents. Yes, they're under 16. All that. Do you follow yeah, what the parents say? Do you overrule the parents or do you listen to the child or you do what's best for the child to survive? Can they legally overrule the parents? Yeah, an uh, ethical committee will. They may end up going through things behind it, but they also may end up going through things the other way. So, you know, you allowed my child to die, that you could have tried this, 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 this. No, we, we tried to give your child blood, you know, but um, all of that. That's ethical. What you think is right and wrong in your head. Whereas laws is, they're ran down, this is what you do. If this is what you do, that's what you do. That's your laws. So make sure that you know the difference of those as well. Um, follow your care, care plan assignments as they are written. Always keep information confidential. That is the HIPAA. <coughs> never, never, never allow um, somebody to talk about your patients. If they start talking and you're in a place where anybody else can just please keep them quiet and say, hey. She's listening. Even if, because even if you didn't see her listening, I will even say, that, hey, she's listening. You, you do not call names. Um, but people would do that. Uh, follow your care plan and assignments. Do not perform, perform any tasks outside your scope of practice. Again, they, they reiterate that. Report all incidents, um, observations, documents. Do not accept gifts or tips. Again, it's right there. Do not get personally or sexually involved with residents or their family members. Again, because they're going to expect some some different care. You know, oh, no, you know, did you take care of grandma? Did you do this for grandma? Did you, you know, that would drive me crazy. <laughs> you need to come see grandma. Come see your own. <laughs> but but um, just be careful with that, too. Don't, just, just know that it's your place of work, and everybody, everybody, you don't want to get into those situations. Um. Know what the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act is? That is uh, the people that actually made us go to school. As a CNA, you used to just walk into a facility and then put you to work. But people was not taking care. They didn't understand what they were supposed to be doing. They, they was neglecting the patients. So in 1987, that's what made us as a school that we have to go. So underline that and know what OBRA is. And again, they tell you about the 75 hours federal, 85 hours for Georgia. Those are also the people that come to the facility and cite you if you are wrong. Cite is C-I-T-E, meaning something was wrong. And when they say, here comes the state, that's the state. Them's the people. And that's what they run up under, that Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. That's when they started running through the hospitals and running through the nursing homes and finding out, let's, let's find out everything and let's get it right. Oh, great. That's wonderful. But they find out all kinds of stuff. Um, and and that's, that's what they, they're there for. And help, help your residents. Uh, the patient, I mean, the, the workers don't like it as much, but um, that's what they're running under. That act that they created in uh, 1987 that says, come on, we, we, we will accept you to come check our facility out if we're going to be a facility in the United States of America. So that is what they do there. That is to cite. So, of course, we got our residence rights, and those are a list of them. They have a right to the quality of life, 
to services and activities to maintain a high level of wellness, to the right to be fully informed, and half of that is also included if they're uh, Spanish, if they are uh, Korean, Japanese, Filipinese, Filipino, <laughs> y'all know what I mean. But all of those, need, if, if they're talking a different language, if they're signing a piece of paper and cannot speak the language, they need to have papers in their language, not to sign stuff in American that they don't know. And if there's legal paperwork, then they need an interpreter. Sometimes they would call up trusted family members. Um, sometimes they will get on the phone and call the uh, translation line and get them to talk. If it's something important, we're going to have a trans, uh, translation person. If they're signing important stuff, <coughs> and important meaning stuff to do with their money, stuff to do with their life, stuff to do with those things especially, uh, and their care. But we'll call in a heartbeat. Whatever language needs to be in, they have the right to participate in their own care and have informed consent. I signed an informed consent one time for that knee, and I always talk about my knee. But what it said in that consent, we will be operating on your meniscus, and we're going to, and it was something else that they had to fix. And pretty much, it may work, or it may not. They may, we may get in there and not do nothing. <laughs> we, <laughs> I'm not lying. Please sign this. Please sign this here. <laughs> and then that was the surgeon. And then here comes the anesthesia. Sign this. You may die. We, we will try to attempt to, re, you know, restore you, but you may die. Sign here. That you agree that that's okay. Oh, you're going to sign. Or you won't have surgery. Yeah, we're ready. We're ready. You're, you're gonna, gonna sign. <laughs> and that's the awfulest thing to sign because when you're rolling in there, you're just going to need surgery. I might die. And that's reality. You may just die. They're terrible. Terrible. I can imagine. You know, they're terrible. And But it's okay. Let me sign here. Because <laughs> you, cause you want your treatment. But it may or may not work. It may mess you up. It may, you know, I can imagine chemo. You know, they're pretty much telling you. Yeah. But all kind of things. But, you know, they tell you, they give you an informed consent. This is what you are agreeing to. And that's called informed consent. Um, they have the right to that. They have the right to know what may or may not happen, what may occur, all the above. Uh, they have the right to make independent choices, privacy, confidentiality. What do we call that act there? Amendment. HIPAA, H-I-P-P-A, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, H-I-P-A-A, HIPAA. The right to dignity, respect, and freedom. Hopefully they're not runners or, or people who uh, get lost, or otherwise we let them go out. We let them walk. We let them go around, you know, as long as it's within somewhere we can see. That's their right. Um, those that get lost... We're going to put those restraints on them, and, and we call them softly restraints, but the um, monitors. So when they get near a door, the monitors go off, all the doors lock. You know, it literally happens like that. Um, hopefully it's quiet, and at um, sunrise it is. It don't, alarms don't go off, but the lock, doors do lock. If they go through it, the alarm goes off. But most of the time, it's, the door's going to lock, and we got no problems. Uh, the right to security of possessions, those are their things. Don't mess with their things. Don't throw away their things. If they say they want to keep their things, make sure we label their things um, because that's what's going to happen next. You you, you and you, y'all got rooms together. She just so happened to like what you got, and she takes your thing. She don't even realize it. She just thought it was pretty. But um, we as our CNAs got to make sure they help keep up with their stuff because you will find this person stuff way in a whole nother room. I, when I first went to the nursing home, there was a lady stopped me and talked about, you want a red shirt? She had three red shirts. Want to purchase a red shirt? I was like, oh, she's all right. She's an entrepreneur in the hospital. <laughs> she was trying to sell her shirts. I said, no, they won't let me buy anything. Um, you might have to uh, talk to your nurses or talk to somebody, maybe the other residents. Maybe they'll be able to buy something. They won't let us buy anything. So she went around and tried to sell them shirts. Find out they would. She done went in other people's rooms and found, and it was all red shirts, and found all the red shirts and wanted to sell them. And was, you know, walking around other people's shirts trying to sell them. I said, Oh, you are slick. <laughs> I, 
I don't know if I would have, I'd have been just, just amazed if I, if I would have bought one from her, <laughs> just to say, you're doing a good job. Go ahead. But she, yes, yeah, just watch out for all that. Um, because you want to watch out for your other patients who she stole from. And we don't call it stealing. It's pillaging or we, they just picked it up, but we're not calling it stealing in the nursing home. Um, even though that is their room, this is their room, but they still in one facility. We try to get it back to where it belongs. Um, so we don't call it still in. They have the rights during transfers and discharges to know where they're going and as fast as they, if they're going to get transferred somewhere, they need to know as soon as they, we know. Let's go tell our patient that they'll be getting transferred to another hospital or to the hospital. Maybe their blood pressure is messed up. Maybe we can't take care of them right now. We're going to have to send them to the hospital because they're, they're that bad. Go tell your patients say, it, to get prepared. Don't ever start picking up their, their stuff, packing it up, and, 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 and they don't know that they're moving. And you taking my stuff out of my house, it's like you're kicking them out. So do, don't just start. Let them know what's happening ahead of time. As soon as you can know. They have the right to complain. They have the right to anybody can visit in them. Anybody that wants to visit can visit. Um, Y'all also watch, make sure they're not um, taking advantage of your residence too. But uh, anybody can visit, uh, lawyers, anybody, even if they want to sue you, they still have the right to go see that lawyer or the lawyer come. They have the right to social services, counseling, assistance, solving problems, helping, helping them write wheels, all the above. We got to make sure of all that. And we're going to take a break because I got to swim in out there. That is uh, part one of chapter one.